and a very warm welcome. It's nice to see a full house uh, for this uh, very special evening. An evening of music and murder. <laughs> Hosted by the sisterhood of St. John the Divine. <laughs> In this 140th a year of their founding by Hannah Greer Coombe, uh, the sisters are renewing their commitment to one of their principal ministries, that of monastic hospitality, offered as St. Benedict requires, with all the courtesy of love in Christ. The sisters' guest host is a 70-year-old building in need of a number of major capital repairs, including replacement of the roof, the windows, and HVAC systems. There's also a great need for far greater accessibility throughout the building, and a number of renovations that will enhance the security, the privacy, and the comfort of their guests. In 2022, the sisters launched a $5 million campaign for the renewal of the guest hosts, and they made a major gift of a million dollars from their own Founders Fund to get things started. In 2023, they made another million dollar gift, but that's the max. <laughs> Support for the, home, for the Home for the Heart campaign has been extraordinarily generous to date, and we're very grateful. We've been blessed by the generosity of a host of individuals who've made very large gifts, each given out of, out of deep respect and gratitude for the sisters and their ministries. All of the dioceses in the ecclesiastical province of Ontario have supported this campaign, as have several dioceses where the sisters once had branch houses. Here, I want to note with particular thanks the very generous gift of $660,000 from the Diocese of Toronto. That was a huge boost. A number of foundations have been invited to uh, support the campaign. Most notably, I might add, is the Sunnybrook Health Services Center Foundation and let's just say we're feeling optimistic. <laughs> as with many campaigns of this nature, as you all know, there is the original goal, and then there's an actual goal. So, our original was 5 million, it's now 6.3. But we are excited to say that we are at 5.4 million in gifts and pledges to date. And we're delighted to welcome you to this fundraising event. Those who are here in Snell Hall and a host of others who are joining us online. We are glad you are here. We're going to begin this evening with music by the Nathan Hiltz Quartet. It, it, in the bulletin, it says the Nathan Hiltz Trio. But uh, at the last minute, uh, it's now the quartet because we have a drummer. An accomplished jazz guitarist, performer, music educator, and artist in residence at Grace Church on the Hill. Nathan is joined by Chris Banks, a much in demand bassist, an active member of the Toronto music scene, who among other commitments, hosts the classic jazz jam at the Rex Hotel. Alex George, a renowned fiddle, violin and mandolin musician, whose talent has graced numerous festival stages, uh, dinner shows, weddings and many corporate functions. And Tim Shia, a drummer, who's just come from a performance at the Pilot, well known throughout Toronto, who regularly accompanies jazz vespers at St. Jude's in Oakville. He also plays for what is called the worst pop band ever. <laughs> the, 
they will be playing murder themed songs written by great composers, including Duke Wellington, Cole Porter, Kurt Well, Louis Armstrong, and Roger and Hart. And we'll also hear compositions original to the quartet this evening. And I'd respectfully ask that as they're performing, you remain in your places. At 8.30 p.m., there will be a reception, a time to mix and mingle over a glass of wine and some finger foods, a time to visit the sales, donation, and auction tables where you'll meet a number of the sisters. The busiest table over there so far this evening has been the auction table. And I'm told that Sister Elizabeth, the Reverend Mother, and Sister Constance Joanna, and I quote, will just be floating. <laughs> I, I can hardly wait to see this. <laughs> I think they're floating with joy and gratitude that you're all here. At 9 p.m. sharp, the radio play begins. Based on Louise Penny's still life and scripted for radio, this evening's production is directed and narrated by Michael Burgess, renowned for his extensive experience in professional theater in the UK and for his spirited leadership as artistic director of Stage Center Productions here in Toronto from 2011 to 2018. He is a retired priest <laughs> with a deep affection and respect for the sisters. And Michael has drawn together an amazing cast of characters for the play. <clears throat> a number of parish clergy from the diocese. A retired dean who sometimes describes himself as being a has-dean. <laughs> a retired archbishop. Several people who grace the concert, opera, and theater stages in Toronto and throughout Ontario. A well-known broadcaster, columnist, and author, now priest. And a high school student with a passion for reggae, rock, and audio plays. They are well rehearsed. They're ready, and they're rearing to go. In her greeting to us tonight, Louise Penny writes, I wish I could be there with you this evening for the production of the play. I understand you have some very suspicious characters. <laughs> It sounds like it's going to be so much fun, and it's for a great cause. Enjoy yourselves this evening. Thank you for being here. So a warm welcome to all of you. And now it's over to the Nathan Hiltz Quartet.
a couple tunes that are not explicitly murder themed. Uh, that first piece was uh, written by the great Duke Ellington, and it was called Reflections in D. And, uh, you know, Duke Ellington's one of my favorite composers. Uh, and he uh, used to play at uh, St. John the Divine, the cathedral in New York City. He did uh, sacred concerts there, and uh, his funeral was there. So I thought that was an interesting connection uh, with tonight. Um, so we'd like to continue with another Ellington piece. Uh, this is from 1928, from when he had a band called the Washingtonians, which was his first group, uh, first band that he had. And uh, it's called Black Beauty, and it's a dedication to the dancer, singer, and actress Florence Mills. Thank you. 
Okay, so thank you very much. So there's a movie from, I believe it's 1959, and it's called Anatomy of a Murder. And uh, I think uh, James Stewart was the, the lead in that film. James Stewart. And uh, it tells uh, the story of a murder trial in a small town. Uh, and, you know, apparently it's a, it's a great movie, but uh, Duke Ellington was asked to do the soundtrack of this movie. And uh, I would say that the soundtrack outshines the, uh, the film. <laughs> Uh, in, so, in some ways. Um, so I'd like to play the main theme from this. This is an anatomy of a murder. And, uh, you know, what do you think of Alex George on the violin? Yeah. 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 Be sure to feature each one of them uh, at, at a different point in the evening. But here you are, anatomy of a murder.
All right. Uh, we'd like to slow things down a bit now. Um, and this one's from another of the great jazz composers. This is by Cole Porter. And it's from a play called Hey Diddle Diddle uh, from the 1930s, I believe 1934. And it was one of these very light, uh, you know, plays to entertain people when, when in, during sad times. But th there's one story in that play about uh, a well-to-do woman who uh, falls in love and is betrayed by her lover and, uh, and then takes revenge and uh, ends up murdering. And so, um, yeah, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't go so well. So I, I'd like to play for you by the great Cole Porter. This is Miss Otis Regrets. Um, and I, maybe I'll just give you, um, you know, just in the spirit of, uh, of this, I, have a, I wrote down a few lines here for you. Uh, Miss Otis Regrets, uh, she, she's unable to lunch today. Uh, when she woke up, she found her dream of love was gone, madam. She ran to the man who had led her so far astray, and from under her velvet gown, she drew a gun and shot her lover down.
And uh, what about uh, my friend Chris Banks on the bass? <laughs> so, uh, so Johnny Cash was uh, uh, serving in the U.S. Uh, Air Force, and he was in serving in West Germany in the 50s, and he was writing a song uh, at night, sitting on his bed, and he was he wanted to write a murder song, and he was trying to think, what's the worst kind of reason a person could have for murdering. And he thought that just to watch him die would be a bad reason to murder, you know? Just for no other thing, like just to see what it looks like. So, uh, and on his first album was this uh, beautiful tune. Uh, well, not beautiful, murderous tune. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, we'd like to do uh, for you uh, Folsom Prison Blues.
How about Tim Shea on the drums? Isn't he great? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so th this last composer we're going to feature here is, uh, his name is Kurt Weil. And uh, a very prolific, wonderful uh, composer. And uh, 
uh, famous, one of his famous things is the, the Three Penny Opera. And uh, there's a character in there named Mac. And, yeah, and Mac is not the nicest guy. Uh, but there's something about him that everyone just loves as well. Like, uh, he's just, there's something charismatic about him. Uh, and he, he does a whole lot of rotten things. And I, I, I don't know, I think he, does, he gets away with them too. He just he never gets a comeuppance. Uh, uh, so, and this song, for, what, for some reason, I, I, you know, if you've heard what the original sounds like, uh, and then you hear what Ella Fitzgerald did with it, or Sonny Rollins did with it, you might wonder why they might have chosen this piece, but for some reason it just works with jazz so, so beautifully, uh, and it really speaks to his wonderful uh, compositions, you know, and his wonderful composing. So I'd like to play for you uh, this piece. This is Mac the Knife. Yeah, thank you. I, I won't read the lyrics, because they, they don't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> But I assume that has to do with the translation from German, maybe? Thank you. 
got a couple more for you. Um, I'd like to f- feature this young fiddle player. Um, he just graduated from uh, Humber College, like only a couple years ago, I believe, right? Yeah, not too long ago. And, uh, you know, he's, he's an emerging talent, and uh, he, uh, he's d- definitely involved with bluegrass music. So I thought we'd do a little something uh, to feature him. This is going to be uh, a set of tunes called Mason's Apron and Trip to Windsor. Yeah, which Windsor would that be? Nova Windsor, Nova Scotia. Really? Oh, all right. Great. Great. was not about murder. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, once more for Alex George on the fiddle. Yeah. And uh, how about Tim Shea on the drums? I mean, I'll just tell you who they all are one more time. Just so you never forget. And uh, after this, if you, if you feel like having a couple more drinks, you can walk down two blocks to the Reservoir Lounge on uh, Wellington Street and hear Chris Banks playing. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, you're all on the guest list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is uh, an electric guitar. My name's Nathan Hiltz. Thank you very much. Thanks for here. Uh, yeah, so the last one, also not about murder. I'd like to play uh, 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 by William Blake, the great Jew- Jerusalem. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the play later. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for having us. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks to the sisters. Uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure.
Your pleasure to be here and our pleasure to have you. Just totally awesome. Thank you very much. I'm just a little bit proud. <laughs> Maybe a whole lot. Uh, we're going to hear uh, some. Um, musical accompaniment throughout the radio play, which has also been uh, prepared by, by Nathan, and uh, we look forward to that. But for now, it's time for us to uh, take a stretch. We're gonna enjoy some uh, wine or soft drinks and some refreshments. Uh, you can go through the, uh, these doors here, and, and across the hall, you'll see a lovely array of drinks and food. Also, the... Um, uh, wine and soft drinks, I think, are going to be circulated in this room, too. Now, just before you leave, uh, Connie has a word to say about the silent auction. I dare not forget. <laughs> I dare not forget. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for coming and being with us tonight and launching this, this wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, one of the things I love about jazz is how it builds community. Um, 
it's, it's a perfect kind of model of community, right? Everybody has their talents and they have to work together, but they're so flexible that they can move from one to the other. It's just incredible to me. So thank you. I think. Uh, Now, there is some just amazing food out there, so I won't keep you from it, and uh, please enjoy as much as you can of it. Um, we do have a fairly tight schedule, so I'm going to ask that while you eat, or before you eat, you visit our tables over here. Um, the auction table in particular will close, the auction um, opportunities will close just before we start the play at nine o'clock. So I wanted to just say a couple of words about some of the things. The Zentangle Labyrinth by our associate Nancy Houghton was her own creation and the labyrinth is actually um, filled with all kinds of different Zentangles. So if you don't know what Zentangles are, you can just go over and see one. There's a picture of it here on this list. We have four of them. And uh, so the four people on the top of the, uh, the, the four top bidders will each get one. <clears throat> um, and then we have two spiritual spa opportunities, one for couples, one for singles, three of each. So there are actually six opportunities. The only sad thing about that is you're gonna have to wait until the guest house is finished <laughs> being renovated. But you'll be among the very first people to come, and it won't be just a weekend at the convent. It's going to have a lot of special surprises. And there is a page for each uh, one of the auction items over there that'll give you a little bit more uh, in uh, information. Um, there will be a, a series of three guitar lessons with Nathan Hiltz, and he said he'll take people from beginner uh, or nothing um, to advanced. So. <laughs> Um, and we have a bread-making workshop with Sister Elizabeth Ann. Are you over there? Yes, she's waving her hand. She's an, uh, just a bread maker par excellence. She has lots of her own recipes, and she keeps us supplied with um, homemade bread at the convent to the point where if she's on vacation or something and we don't get any, we pick up a bag of bread from the bakery, you know, and we say, oh, is this all there is today? Um, <laughs> And there is a, a, a wonderful opportunity with Michael Burgess, who's going to be directing this play, who is directing this play, called Reading Aloud in Church. So if you would like your church group to learn how better to read in church, Michael is going to be a lot of fun and a huge help. So please visit, and let's have the lights on, please. Thank you. When the lights when the lights dim, come back in and take your place. <laughs> the radio show starts at nine sharp. <laughs> Might have to be nine on nine. on any tourist map, it was generally found unexpectedly and with a degree of surprise that such an elderly village should have been hiding in this valley all along. Anyone fortunate enough to find it once usually found their way back. And Thanksgiving in early October was the perfect time. Clara Morrow sat at a table by the window in the village bistro. 
She was waiting for her friend and next door neighbor, Jane Neal, to arrive. Hi, Clara. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, you're trembling. I didn't think you cared. You're a filthy old hag, Jane. <laughs> Why were you late? You mean you didn't hear? No, what happened? Well, I caught three boys throwing duck manure at Gabrielle and Olivier. Could it have been a joke? Oh, no. No, it was no joke. They were yelling, fags, queers, degoulas. They were just boys, you say? Well, they wore ski masks, so it was hard to tell. But I think I recognized them. I even yelled their names. Philippe Croft, Gus Hennessy, Claude Lapierre. Oh, no. Oh, I never thought I'd live to see the day that this would happen here. So that's why you were late? Yes. Well, no. Could you be more vague? Maybe. <laughs> You're on the jury for the next Art William Berg's show, right? Yes, we're meeting this afternoon. Peter's on it too, why? Well, I'm ready. I was late because I have a painting I'd like to enter in the show, and... And Jay, if I'd known it was this painful, I'd never kept you to show your art. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 dear, you don't understand. These are tears of pain. No, I was surprised by joy, finally. What is it called, your painting? Fair Day. It's the closing of the parade at the county fair. And so it was that later on that day, on the Friday before Thanksgiving, that Peter Morrow lifted the painting onto an easel in the Gallery of Arts Williamsburg and revealed for the first time for anyone to see the artwork of Jane Neal. That painting is hideous. It's, it's wonderful. A four-year-old can do better than that. Well, I guess the choice is easy enough, at least. That's a reject. Oh, come on, Myrna. You don't have to say that. You know what? I think it's wonderful. Yes, I agree. I think it's more than wonderful. I think it's brilliant. Oh, please. You're just saying that to support your husband. Okay, Peter, tell us what you see. Well, Ruth, to tell you the truth, it does look like a parade and... These cows do look like cows. And uh, look at these people sitting in the stands. I know they are stick figures, but I can recognize everyone from the village. And um, their cheeks all have such a healthy, perfect, round red circle of a glow. I don't know. I, but I do know we need to accept it. It's a risk. But Myrna, what's the worst that can happen? The people who see the show think we've made a mistake? They always think that. If we start accepting works based not on their value as art, but because we like the artist, we're ruined. Why don't we set Faraday aside and look at the rest of the artwork? And so they debated for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> By the time they looked at Faraday again, they were wiped out and just wanted it to be over. <laughs> and it came to be that Jane's painting was accepted amidst an unusually silent jury. Later that evening, Peter and Clara had invited their friends, Olivier, Gabri, Myrna, Ruth, Jane and Ben, for a pre-Thanksgiving dinner. They were gathered in the living room around the murmuring fireplace. About your garden, Jane, Will you be needing any help cutting it back this year? Oh, no, thank you, Gabri. It's almost done. But this might be the last year. I'm not getting any younger, you know. You didn't show any weakness this morning. Now, don't you dare, young man. What those kids did was hideous. But of course, they were right. I am gay. Gardening does keep me healthy. How did those single yellows do for you? I didn't notice them. I put them in last fall, but they never called me mother. <laughs> Dinner's ready. You know, Jane, I believe a great artist always puts a lot of themselves into their work. What's Fair Day's special meaning, then? 
Now, Ben, that would be cheating. You have to figure it out. It's there, and you'll figure it out, I'm sure. But why is your painting called Fair Day? Well, it was painted at the county fair, the closing parade. On the afternoon, your mother passed away. Uh, was that only a month ago already? Yeah, the, the day of the antique show in Ottawa. I wish I'd never gone. Well, if it's okay, I might just sneak down and take a look at Fair Day before the show. I'd like to invite all of you over for drinks after the opening at the exhibition. In my living room, I have a bit of a surprise for you. No kidding. Miss Jane Neal met her maker in the early morning mist of Thanksgiving Sunday. <laughs> Miss Neal's was not a natural death, unless you're of the belief everything happens as it's supposed to. If so, for her 76 years, Jane had been walking towards this final moment when death met her in the brilliant maple woods on the verge of the village of Three Pines. Oui, oui, allo. Chief Inspector, this is Jean Guy. There's been a murder. Where? A village in the eastern townships called Three Pines. Three Pines? Three Pines? Never heard of it. <laughs> Could it be called something else? Trois Pins, perhaps? I'll meet you there in two hours. <laughs> Agent Yvette Nicole, this is Chief Inspector Gamache of the Sûreté du Québec. Agent Nicole here got the call and came to Three Pines immediately. She secured the scene, then called us. Well done, Agent Nicole. Anything strike you when you arrived? Bien sûr. I saw that man there, an Anglais. I suspected by his clothes and his pallor, the English, I have noticed, have weak stomachs. His name is Ben Hadley. Was Miss Neal robbed? We don't think so. Mr. Hadley says she never wore jewelry and rarely carried a handbag. And her house key? No, no key. Mr. Hadley says people don't lock up around here. Well, they will now. <laughs> Any idea what could have created such a tiny wound? It's hunting season, so perhaps a bullet? Though it doesn't look like a bullet wound I've ever seen. Uh, it's actually bow hunting season. Guns don't start for two weeks. So where's the arrow? Uh, and is there an exit wound? I don't know. We haven't let the medical examiner move her. Uh, thank you, Beauvoir. Agent Nichols, tell us what you know. Her name is Jane Neal, age 76. Never been married. We got this information from Mr. Hadley, who says she was the same age as his mother who died a month ago. Now well, that's interesting. Two elderly women die within a month of each other in this tiny village? I wonder. I wonder, too. His mother died after a long battle with cancer. Uh, they could see it coming for a year. Go on. Ben Hadley was walking in the woods at about 8 this morning. A regular occurrence. Miss Neal's body was lying across the path. Impossible to miss. And what did he do? He says he knelt down and shook her. He thought she had a stroke or heart attack. <coughs> Says he was about to do CPR when he noticed the wound. Uh, I don't know why he didn't notice she was staring blank eyed and was as cold as marble. <laughs> unless. Uh, unless he was in shock. Look at him over there. It's been three hours since he found her and he is still sick. This woman was important to him. Unless he is faking it. Sir? Uh, Beauvoir, does anyone else know about the death of Miss Neal? Uh, there was I, I, a group of villagers on the road, sir. Inspector Beauvoir? I've tried to keep this a sterile site. No outsiders, but... Uh, it's time to speak with Ben Hadley. <laughs> Mr. Hadley, I'm Chief Inspector Gamache of the Cirque du Québec. This is Inspector Beauvoir and Agent Yvette Nicole. How can I help? I'm sorry about the death of Miss Neal. Was she a close friend? Very. She actually taught me at the school. 
the schoolhouse right here. She, she was a wonderful woman. I wish I was good with words. I, I could begin to describe her for you. I, I just don't understand what happened. Uh, tell us about this morning, please. I went out for a walk with my dog, Daisy, but she has arthritis, and this morning she was very sore. Anyway, I, I soon brought her back to the house and took myself off for a walk. This was a quarter to eight, I think. It takes a few minutes to walk here, up the road and past the schoolhouse, then into the woods. Did you see anyone? No, no, I didn't. It's possible someone saw me, but I didn't. I tend to walk with my head down, lost in thought, I suppose. I was walking along the path and almost tripped all over her. Funny, but it never occurred to me that she was dead. But then I suddenly noticed a stillness and my, well, my mind exploded. Did you touch the wound? I think I might have. I, I panicked and like a, oh, I don't know what, a hysterical child, I ran in circles. Anyway, I finally got a hold of myself and dialed 911 on my cell phone. Uh, I'm curious, why did you bring a cell phone to walk in the woods? Partly out of fear that, that I'll get shot by some drunken hunter. I need to call for help. No, I'm, I'm sorry about these questions, Mr. Hadley. You're an important witness. The person who finds the body is always near the top of our list of suspects. <laughs> Suspected of what? I mean, what are you saying? That's Jane Neal over there. A retired school teacher who tended roses and ran the ACW. It can't be anything but an accident. You're absolutely right, Mr. Hadley. That's by far the likeliest possibility. But did you call anyone else on your phone? Oh, such an idiot. It never occurred to me uh, to call Peter or Clara or anyone. I just didn't want to leave Jane. The shock, I suppose. Who are Peter and Clara? Uh, Peter and Clara Morrow. They live next door to Jane. Jane and Clara were like mother and daughter. Oh, poor Clara. Do you think they know? Well, let's find out. May I walk with you, Mr. Hadley, to the village? I haven't been there yet. Yes, of course. Gamash was impressed by how beautiful the village was. He loved the old homes facing the village green that sat, not surprisingly, in the center of the village. Everything looked so natural undesigned. Gamache walked into the bistro and settled in front of the fire. I'm sorry to disturb you. My name is Ruth Sardo. Is it true? Is Jane dead? Yes, Madame Sardo. I'm very sorry that... Then what are you doing here while Jane is lying dead in the woods? What kind of police are you? Who killed Jane? Ruth Zardo, my job is to find out why your friend is dead, and I will do that. I will do that in the manner I see fit. I will not be bullied, and I will not be treated with disrespect. This is my investigation. Never, ever swing that cane in my company again. <laughs> and never speak to me like that again. How dare I? This officer is obviously hard at work. Mustn't disturb the best the surete has to offer. I'm sorry, forgive me. I suppose I could blame Jane's death for my poor behavior, but as you'll discover, I'm just like this. I have no talent for choosing my battles. Life seems strangely like a battle to me, the whole thing. So I can expect more where that came from. Oh, I, oh, I think so. But I promise not to whack my cane, at least around you. How did it happen? It looks like a hunting accident. But can you think of anyone who would want to deliberately kill your friend? Well, there were those boys who threw manure at Olivier and Gabri. She did identify them. And why do you think those boys might have killed her? She'd already announced their names, so it's not as though killing her would stop that. What's game? Revenge? Uh, this is the Chief Inspector. I'll be right over. Good afternoon, Chief Inspector. Thank you for coming so quickly. Uh, the coroner's report found something odd. Two bits of feather embedded in the wound. Feathers? Don't arrows have feathers? They used to. Now they're plastic. Also, there was very little blood, consistent with instant death. 
She was killed where she was found. Time of death between 6.30 and 7 this morning. And have you found an arrow yet? No, nothing so far. Just 15 million leaves all over. I would like to know why a hunter, if he accidentally shot Miss Neal, would bother removing the arrow. And we need to find out more about Timmer Hadley's death a month ago, Ben's mother. The two deaths are so close together. Uh, I'm going to the Moros now. Uh, Beauvoir, come with me. You too, Agent Nicole. Mr. Peter Morrow, we are from the Sûreté de Québec. May we come in? Yes, of course. I heard the, Montre uh, the, the Montreal News say rain's on the way. Of course, they're always wrong. <laughs> we seem to have a microclimate here. Must be the mountains. Uh, this is Clara. Coffee? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Morrow, we regret to inform you that your neighbor, Jane Neal, has been found dead this morning. Dear. Jane, yes, we've heard. I just can't believe it. We're very sorry for your loss, but we need to ask you a few questions. It's just not possible. We think Jane Neal's death was an accident, but we have a problem. We can't find a weapon, and no one's come forward. So we're going to have to investigate this as a suspicious death. Can you think of anyone who would want to harm your friend? Not a soul. Jane ran bake sales and rummage sales for the ACW here at St. Thomas's. She led a quiet, uneventful life. <laughs> Does anyone gain by her death? I don't think so. She was comfortable, but out here money goes a long way, thankfully. Uh, how about her home? Yes, that would be worth quite a lot, but quite a lot by Three Pines standards, not Montreal standards. She could get maybe a... 150000 for it? Perhaps a little more? Could there be another way someone could gain by her death? Not an obvious one. Very well. Uh, we need a place where we could use as an incident room. A, a quiet place where we can make our temporary headquarters in Three Pines. Can you think of a suitable spot? There's the old schoolhouse. The, the one where Miss Neal worked? That's it. It's owned by Ben, but the Archery Club uses it these days. The Archery Club? We've had one for years. Uh, ben and I started it. Uh, is it locked? Do you have the key? Well, I have one somewhere. Ben has one too. But it is never locked. Maybe it should have been. I'd like to call a community meeting in the morning at St. Thomas's at 11.30. But we need to get the word out. Oh, that's easy. Tell Olivier at the bistro and he'll have the whole province coming. <laughs> And his partner, Gabriel, the choir director. Uh, I don't think we'll need music. Well, neither do I. Uh, but you do need to get in. He has a set of keys. The archery club is open, but the church is locked. <laughs> the minister's from Montreal. Never trust a skinny cook. Muffins, anyone? Uh, pardon, Monsieur Gabriel. Uh, welcome to my B&B. I have carrot muffins, banana, and a special tribute to Jane called Charles de Mille. They aren't Charles de Mille roses, of course. They're long, they're long dead. Désolé, excuse moi, I'm just so sad. Any idea how or why your friend died? It was a hunter, wasn't it? Please help me uh, bring the brute to justice. We don't actually know if it was a hunter, but if it wasn't, who comes to mind? I can't think of anyone, but am I likely to? I mean, isn't that what's so horrible about murder? We don't see it coming? I'm not saying this very well. The people I've been angriest at probably never even realized. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> yeah, it does. It makes perfect sense. Who knows what evil lurks in the heart of men? <laughs> When Peter walked into the kitchen, he saw Clara was wrapped around Jane's dog, Lucy, who herself was a tight ball of golden retriever. Peter knelt down and kissed Clara. Then he kissed Lucy's head, but the dog didn't stir. 
Every day for Lucy's entire dog life, Jane had sliced a banana for breakfast and had miraculously dropped one of the perfect discs on the floor where it sat for an instant before being gobbled up. Every morning, Lucy's prayers were answered, confirming her belief that God was old and clumsy and smelt like roses and lived in the kitchen. <laughs> but no more. Lucy knew her God was dead. And she now knew the miracle wasn't the banana, it was the hand that offered the banana. Clara, the police are gone now. Can we talk? We need to talk about Jane. I don't want to talk. Remember when you and Jane would talk? Every week, I would just be in my studio painting, but I left the door open. <clears throat> you didn't know that, did you? Did my best work listening to you two. You and Jane talked about everything. Gardening, books, relationships, cooking. And you talked about your beliefs, remember? Yes. Well, she wouldn't want you to be sad. You should get on to the next thing, don't you think? You should start another painting. Screw off. <laughs> Leave me alone. Where are your tears, hey? You're more dead than she is. You can't even cry. And now what? You want me to stop? It hasn't even been a day yet, and you're what? Bored with it? You want everything to go back the way it was like that? Clara, I am sad. I understand. But I love you. I, I was just trying to help. All those questions, questions you and Jane debated and laughed about and argued over the years, she has the answers to all of them now. I don't know. I'm sorry. St. Thomas's was filling up rapidly. With the rain just beginning, there wasn't much milling about. The tiny parking lot at the side of the chapel was packed, and trucks and cars lined the circular commons. Inside, the small church was overflowing and warm. When Peter, Clara, and Ben arrived, they squeezed in and joined the line of people leaning against the back wall. Uh, my name is Armand Gavache. This is my second in command, Inspector Jean-Guy Beauvoir. There are other Surete officers around the room. I expect they're obvious to you. If this death were an accident, and the person who killed Jane Neal is here, I want you to know a few things. It must have been horrible when you realized what you'd done. But you need to come forward and admit it. The longer you wait, the harder it will be for us, for the community, and for yourself. We will find you. That's what we do. You'll see us everywhere. We'll be asking questions, checking backgrounds, talking not just to you, but to your neighbors, and your employers, and your family, and your friends. We all have secrets. And before this is over, I'll know most of yours. Did you log your call last night? No, but I will tonight. My family has been here for hundreds of years. And we raised to believe private property doesn't exist in hunting season. No, no. I'd like everyone here who owns a bow hunting set, even if you haven't used it in years, to give your name and address to Inspector Beauvoir here. Just hunting? Why? What do you have in mind? Well, the bows and arrows for recreational archery are called recurve and are different from the hunter's equipment. But they would bring the same results if used against a person? Well, yes, though the arrows are different. You'd have to be amazingly lucky, or unlucky, to kill with a target shooting arrow. Mr. Chief Inspector, my name is Matthew Croft. I would like to add that a hunter's arrow has four, sometimes five razors at the end tapering into a tip. Would it produce a wound like on this sketch here? Yes, exactly like that. Uh, so this would have to have been done by a hunting arrow. Uh, would an arrow go through a body? Yes, right through. And how far would an arrow go after that? Hmm, that's a good question. 10, 15 feet. Would it be hard to find? Not really. 
If you're an experienced hunter, you know exactly where to look. Do you hunt, Mr. Croft? No, sir. Not anymore. Do you own a bow hunting set? Yes, sir, I do. Chief Inspector! Chief Inspector! I'm sorry to disturb you, but I've thought of something odd. Ah, sustenance. Well, this is a pretty small nugget, so that's why I didn't want to mention it at the town meeting, but who knows. It just struck me as a strange coincidence, and I thought you should know. It's about Jane's art. I don't think it's that big a deal. It's just that Jane painted all her life, but never let anyone see her work. But last week, she decided to show her work at Art Williamsburg. She just decided Friday morning, and the judging was Friday afternoon. Her painting was accepted. Got accepted and got murdered. That is odd. Uh, speaking of odd, is it true Miss Neal never invited anyone into her living room? It's true, but we've gotten so used to it that it doesn't seem strange. Uh, but why not? Didn't you ever ask? I suppose we did when we first arrived. Or maybe we asked Timur and Ruth, but I know for sure we never got an answer. No one seems to know. Gabri thinks she has orange shed carpet and pornography. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think? I just don't know. But would you like to come and see the painting at Art Williamsburg? Well, certainly. So is this it? Not even close. This is another artist. The member's exhibition opens in 10 days. Oh, uh, that's the Vernissage. Exactly. Two weeks after the judging. Excuse me, Chief Inspector. May I see you for a moment? I just got off the phone with Timur Hadley's doctor. Her death was completely natural as far as he's concerned. Kidney cancer. Uh, did she die at home? Yes, on September 2nd of this year. Labor Day. Uh, Mrs. Morrow, what do you think about Ben's mother's death? Timmer's death was expected, but still a bit surprising. <laughs> well, no, that's overstating it. It's just that we took turns sitting with her. That day, it was Ruth's turn. They'd arranged beforehand that if Timmer was feeling good, Ruth would steal away to the closing parade of the county fair. Ruth gave her her meds, brought a fresh glass of Venture, and then left. Just left a dying woman alone? I know it sounds uncaring, even selfish, but we'd all been looking after her for so long. Ruth would have never left if she had the slightest hint Timmer was in trouble. It was terrible for her when she came back and found Timmer dead. So it was unexpected? In that sense, yes. But we since found out from the doctors that it often happens that way. But why are you interested in Timmer's death? Just being thorough. Two elderly women dying within a few weeks of each other in a very small village? Well, it begs some questions. Here we are. There is Jane's picture. Uh, do you like it? Not at first. But the longer I look, the more I like it. Here you can recognize Nellie and Wayne. And here's Peter. Uh, how'd she do it? How could she get these people so accurately with dots for eyes? and squiggly lying for a mouth. I don't know. I'm an artist, have been all my life, and I couldn't do that. What's it about? It's the closing parade at the county fair on this year's Labor Day. Oh, great. Why did the village people come to Peter and Clara's house this time? Hey, they invited us. I was wrong. It's just a couple of old hags. You bitch. Look at these fabulous cream-filled cakes. Mine. All mine. I thought you were a chocoholic. Any port in the storm. Oh. Haven't had one of these in years. And yet, they're so becoming. Stop. That's mine. Don't touch it. Don't you have booze to offer your guests? Has any of <laughs> Has any of you guys solved Jane's death before the police? I heard in the Société des Alcools that that great oaf Gamache had actually searched the Croft place. Ridiculous. Oh yeah, big to do. Turned the place upside down and apparently found something. But they won't arrest Matthew, surely. Could Matthew have killed Jane? I can't believe it. Why not? Well, that's true. 
Though I think he would own up to it. But this was no ordinary mistake. I think it'd be only natural to run away. Do you? I, th I think so. I mean, don't get me wrong. I really hope I'd call for help and take what's coming. I think you would. It goes back to that quote of yours, Clara. Conscience and cowardice are the same thing. Oscar Wilde, actually. But why not admit it? I agree with you, Ben. At first, it would be acceptable for Matthew to run. But after a while, I couldn't live carrying a secret like that. You just have to get better at keeping secrets. <laughs> so it might have been Matthew Croft after all? No, I don't think so. An experienced bow hunter wouldn't kill someone by accident. Bastard. One thing is true. Whoever killed Jane was a very good bow hunter. There's a lot of them around, unfortunately, thanks to the archery club. Murder. Murder. We get the idea. So if Matthew Croft did it, it was on purpose? Matthew Croft was to remember for the rest of his life where he was when the police car drew up. It was three minutes past 11 on the kitchen clock. He had expected them much earlier. Every fall at canning season, his wife Suzanne would invariably ask, when does a cucumber become a pickle? <laughs> at first, he'd try to answer that question. But over the years, he realized there was no answer. At what point does change happen? Sometimes it's sudden, but often it's a gradual change, an evolution. For four hours waiting, Matthew wondered what had happened. When did things start to go wrong? This too, he couldn't answer. Uh, good morning, Mr. Croft. May we come in? C come in. We have the results of the tests from the bow and arrows. Jane's Neal, Jane Neal's blood was on the bow we found in your basement. It was also on some pieces of clothing belonging to your son, Philippe. The arrow tip matches the wound. We believe your son accidentally killed Jane Neal. What will happen to him? I'd like to talk to Philippe. I see. W would he have to go to jail? I have no intention of charging Philippe with manslaughter. So what might happen to him? Uh, he'll be taken to the station in Saint-Rémy and charged with mischief. But he's just a boy. Uh, he's 14, old enough to know right from wrong. He needs to know that when he does something wrong, however unintentionally, there's a consequence. Was Philippe one of the boys who threw manure at Monsieur Dubois and Brûlé? Yes. He came home and bragged about it. May I see him? Yeah, what do you want? Uh, Philippe, I'm Chief Inspector so, Gamache of this. So what? We're here about the death of Jane Neal. Yeah, I heard about that. What's it to do with me? We think you did it, Philippe. Oh, why? Because she happened to yell my name out loud. There was three of us in case you didn't know. Her blood was on some of your clothing and on your bike, too. I didn't do it. Uh, how do you explain these things, then? How do you? <laughs> this is what I think happened. You went out that Sunday morning early. Something prompted you to take the old bow and arrow and ride your bike to that spot. We knew it was where your grandfather used to hunt. Then something happened. Either your hand slipped and the arrow shot out by mistake, or you deliberately shot thinking it was a deer. Either way, the result was catastrophe. Look, man, I know you old, so let me say this again slowly. <laughs> I was not there, comprend? Then who did? Let's see, who could have done it? Well, who in this house is an expert hunter? Are you saying that your father killed Jane Neal? Are you an idiot? Of course he did it. What about the blood stains on your bike, your look, clothes? Look, I'll tell you what happened. You might want to write this down. He didn't say that. He couldn't have. 
Philippe couldn't have said those things. We know what we heard, Mr. Croft. Philippe says you often abused him, and out of fear of a beating, he helped you cover your crime. That's how he came to have the blood on him and his prints on the bow. He says you killed her. Okay, he's right. I killed Jane Neal. I'm sorry, Mr. Croft, but I still believe Philippe killed Miss Neal by accident. You're wrong. Everything Philippe says is true. Including the beating? You told us you didn't hunt anymore. I lied. Why'd duo into the woods behind the schoolhouse? Dunno. I, I guess that's where my father always hunted. No, there must be another reason. Well, there isn't. I took his old bow and arrows and went to his old hunting grounds to feel closer to my father. Point final. What happened? I heard a sound, something coming through the trees, like a deer. As soon as the shape appeared, I fired. But it wasn't a deer. No, it was Miss Neal. And what did you do? I ran to her, but I could see she was dead, so I panicked. What happened then? I can't remember anything after that. But isn't that enough? I killed Miss Neal. That's all you need to know. But why didn't you come forward? I didn't think you'd find out. When we arrived, I told you we thought Philippe had killed Miss Neal. Why didn't you confess then? I was too stunned. Oh, come on, Mr. Croft. You were waiting for us. You knew what the lab test would show. And yet you're saying you were going to have your son arrested for a crime you yourself committed? I don't think you're capable of that. You have no idea what I'm capable of. Both Philippe and Matthew Croft had been arrested by the time the memorial service for Jane Neal was held two days later. The service was nothing more than Jane's friends getting up one after the other and talking about her in French and English. The service was simple and the message was clear. God wouldn't ask Jane how many committees she'd sat on or how much money she'd made or what prizes she'd won. No, he'd ask how many fellow creatures she'd helped and Jane Neal would have an answer. What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? Early in the morning. Hey ho, and up she rises. Hey ho, and up she rises. Hey ho, and up she rises. Early in the morning. Why, drunken sailor? Well, it was one of Jane's favorite songs. She was always singing it. She told me she learned it for school to teach, right, Ruth? Well, this was when she first started 50 years ago. She was expected to teach every subject, but since she couldn't sing or play the piano, I taught her the song. Can't say I'm surprised. It was the only song her students ever learned. Well, your Christmas pageants must have been something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were. We sang all the carols, but they were all to the tune of Drunken Sailor. <laughs> The ritual was led by Myrna. There were 20 or so women, clad in woolen sweaters and mitts and toques, standing in the center of the village green. This is a ritual of celebration and cleansing. Its roots go back thousands of years, but its branches reach out and touch us today and embraces anyone who wants to be included. This is a prayer stick. Isn't that a beaver stick? <laughs> Of course, that's exactly what it is. The ritual was designed for them to let go of the anger and fear that hung around them, to banish the hate and invite the trust and warmth back. Amon Gamash was sitting on the outskirts of the village green watching. He was soon joined by Benjamin Hadley. About time for the leaves to change. The sun's getting lower in the sky. Mm. Do they do this ritual often? About twice a year. I was at the last ritual. Didn't get it. Perhaps if they talked to each other now and then, we'd understand. Uh, how long have you loved her? Who? Clara. How long have you loved her? 
we were all at art school together, though Peter and I were a couple of years ahead of Clara. He fell for her right away. And you? It took me a little longer. I think I'm more guarded than Peter. I find it harder to open up to people. I mean, I used to dream about us getting together, but that was long ago. I could never, ever do anything like that. Not to Peter. We must form a circle. I brought these ribbons. <laughs> I asked you all to bring something that was symbolic of Jane. I have brought this book for you, Jane, to thank you for sharing your love of the written word with me. Bless you. One by one, the women took a ribbon, tied an item to it, and spoke a few words. Some were prayers, some were simple explanations. Time passed. And Clara looked around and saw their circle was no longer bound by fear, but was loose and open. Clara allowed her gaze to follow the ribbons as they were caught in the wind. Her eye caught something attached to the tree behind the ribbons. High up in one of the maple trees, she saw an arrow. So, it's an arrow. What's the big deal? Mr. Croft, listen carefully. This arrow was found 25 feet up a maple tree two hours ago, where Jane Neal was killed. Is this one of your father's? Yes. My father always made his own feathering. It was a hobby of his. Now, you have a lot to tell us. I need to think. But there's nothing to think about. Your son shot this arrow, didn't he? And if he shot this arrow and it ended up here in that tree, then he couldn't have killed Jane Neal. He didn't do it, and neither did you. This arrow proves someone else did it. We need the truth from you now. Now! All right, this is what happened. Philippe and I had had an argument the night before. Some stupid thing I can't even remember what. The next morning, when I got up, Philippe was gone. I was afraid he'd run away. But about 7.15, he comes skidding into the yard with his bike. He went directly into the basement. He never did come to see me, but stayed in his room all day. That wasn't unusual. When did you hear about Miss Neal? That same night, a week ago. I heard it was a hunting accident. When I went to your meeting the next day, I was sad, but not like it was the end of the world. It's after I came back home. Something was troubling me. I went downstairs, and that's when I found Philippe's clothes ready for the wash with blood stains on them. I confronted him, and he said he thought he killed her, so he grabbed the arrow and ran. I guess he didn't notice it wasn't the same as the others. So someone else shot the arrow that killed Jane Neal. Now we know that she was almost certainly murdered. Where to now, Jane's, Jane Neal's home? Let's go. Tabernack. <laughs> If I was Jane Neal, I'd keep the people out, too. Sacrament. <laughs> they stood on the threshold of Jane's living room, frozen in place. Jane's living room assaulted them with colors. Huge flowers day-glowed. Psychedelic mushrooms advanced and retreated. Enormous, maniacal, yellow, happy faces marched around the fireplace. The floor, hand-hewn by a man being chased by winter 200 years ago, had been painted pink, glossy pink. It was a veri veritable parade of bad taste. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chief, but I did not expect this. Why? Maybe she needed a change. <laughs> That's not what I was asking, jean -Guy. I was wondering why Miss Neal kept her friends out of here. Isn't it obvious? <laughs> no, no, it isn't. If she did this, she must have liked this style. 
Uh, she certainly wouldn't have been ashamed of it. So why keep them out? What secret does this room hold? Want to check upstairs? Uh, Jean-Guy, have you noticed that there is something missing in this house? There's no easel, no paints, there's no studio. Where did she do her art? How about the basement? Well, sure, go down and check, but I can guarantee you an artist isn't going to paint in a windowless basement. You know, there are no pictures in the walls either. Anywhere. I just don't get it. All of this is odd. The wallpaper, the painted rooms and floors, the lack of pictures. But none of it's so odd she'd have to keep her friends out. But there is something around here that she didn't want anyone to see. The surety officers were now crawling all over the home, taking fingerprints and samples. They made it very strange, and yet Clara knew that Jane was there too, in the space between the strangers. Part of Clara wanted to turn around and go home to never see what Jane had so deliberately kept from them all. They eventually found what it was. It was not in plain view for everyone to see, but hidden underneath the wallpaper. It's like being in a cave filled with ancient symbols and depictions. This is the history of Three Pines and its people, drawn all over the walls of this house. But these walls are covered from floor to ceiling. Here's the schoolhouse with children and animals and adults working. Here's an accident. I remember that day. And, and here is a funeral. Look at, a, at all of us in there. You can actually, actually see joy, sadness, delight. This is brilliant. The answer's here, Jean-Guy. The murderer is here, somewhere on these walls. Oh, Jane, I am so sorry. Sorry for what? Sorry she didn't know we loved her enough to be trusted with this. Sorry she felt she had to hide it from us. Ha, I thought I was the only one with a wound. What a fool. I think Jane was killed because she was about to let everyone see her work. I don't know why, but there you have it. You knew her all her life. I want you to tell me what you see here. What strikes you, what patterns you see. Okay, everyone, now what? Now that we can have two minutes without those villagers, let's review what we have. We have Peter and Clara Morrow. Motives? Money. They have very little, or had. Now that the will has been opened, we know now that they were rich, of course. Before Jane Neal died, uh, they, they were practically paupers. They lived frugally. She teaches art in the winter to pay bills, and they sometimes pick up contracts to restore art. We only have Mrs. Morrow's word for it that they didn't know what was in the will. Miss Neal might have told them they'd inherit, Nespa. Uh, if they needed money, wouldn't they have gone to Miss Neal for a loan instead of murdering her? Maybe they did, and she said no. Uh, they had the best chance of luring her into the woods. If Clara or Peter had called her at 6.30 in the morning, She'd have gone, no questions asked. And Peter Morrow was an accomplished archer. He could have gotten the equipment from the clubhouse. He was on the jury that chose her artwork. Uh, who else? Uh, ben Hadley. He's also a good archer with access to weapons and trusted by Miss Neal. But without a motive. Uh, well, not money anyway. He's worth millions, all inherited from his mother. Anyone else? Ruth Zardo. Uh, we don't know that Ruth Zardo didn't actually kill Timur Hadley. It happens a lot in cases like this. A friend, or more often a family member, gives the person a fatal dose. Mercy. There's a kind of unwritten agreement that in terminal cases, at the end of life, we don't look too closely. Nobody checked? Saw no need. But maybe Jane knew someone, or something, or suspected Jane was the type, I think, who would have gone directly to Ruth and asked her about her suspicions. But Ruth Sardo couldn't have actually fired the gun, the arrow. The 
the Arts Williamsburg show was enjoying a record turnout for a vernissage. At past openings, only the artists themselves and a few scraggly friends would show up, fortifying themselves with wine from boxes and homemade cheese products. <laughs> this night, a gnarly knot of people surrounded Jane's work, which was sitting cloaked on an easel in the center of the room. As you know, a tragic event has robbed us of a fine woman, <coughs> and as it turns out, a gifted artist. Here, without further ado, is Fair Day by Jane Neal. Ooh. What is it? Nothing. Mr. Morrow, my question wasn't about the aesthetics, but about murder. Please answer it. The painting disturbs me. I can't tell you why, because I don't know why. It doesn't seem to be the same work we judged two weeks ago, and yet I know it is. So what's changed? Nothing. Maybe me? Is that possible? Does art change too? Maybe Jane's death changed me so much that whatever I saw in this painting isn't there anymore. Do you believe that? No. Oh, that's me, over there, that dancing goat. <laughs> I've got it. This was painted at the closing parade, right? The day your mother died, Ben. In fact, isn't that your mother, that flying lamb in the clouds? You're right. It's Timmer. Do you see? It was Jane's tribute to your mother. Everyone in this picture was meaningful to her. Remember that last dinner we all had together? Thanksgiving. We were all talking about great art, and I said I thought art became art when artists put something of themselves into it. I asked Jane what she put into this work, and do you remember what she said? Yeah, sorry, I, I can't. She agreed that she put something in it, that there was some message in it. She wondered if we'd figure it out. In fact, I remember she looked directly at you, Ben, when she spoke as though you'd understand. I've wondered why at the time, but now it makes sense. This is for your mother. You really think? An hour later, the party had emigrated from Arts Williamsburg to Jane's home. Clara positioned herself in the living room, just as Jane might have done so that as everyone arrived, she could see their reactions. All around them on the walls was the geography and history of Three Pines. And in the middle of the room, on an easel, was Fair Day. What is it? I don't know. Something's not right. Have you noticed Jane never made up a face? Everyone on these walls was someone she knew, someone from the village. Or a visitor. Actually, there are no visitors. People who moved away and would come to visit, yes, but they're considered villagers. Everyone on these walls she knew. And everyone in Fairday she knew, except her. This person here, this blonde woman, she's a stranger. But there's more. I've been wondering what's wrong with Fairday. It's clearly Jane, but it's not. Everything in it is strong, confident, purposeful, but taken as a whole, it doesn't work. She's right, it doesn't. But it worked when we were judging it, right? It's her, over here. Jane didn't paint her. That's why the picture doesn't work. It did before this face was changed. Whoever changed it changed the whole picture without realizing it. And how do you know that Jane didn't paint this face? There's actual proof if you want. Uh, it would make a nice change. Look. <laughs> Now that I look more closely, I must have been blind not to see it before. Oh, for God's sake, just tell us before I spank you. <laughs> there. It's like a wart, a huge blemish on the work. That's done by a rag and mineral spirit, right, Ben? And look at those brush strokes, all wrong, up and down. Jane doesn't do up and down strokes, a dead giveaway. Do you notice the paint? No, nothing strange about the paint. Oh, come on, look. But why would someone paint a face? That's the question. 
And whoever did this also took out a face. They, they didn't just paint on top of the existing face, they actually erased the whole face. But if you did just paint over the existing face, could you remove the new face and find the original underneath? It's tricky, but a good art restorer could. Whoever did this didn't want the face found. So she removed hers and painted in another woman. You said she. Why? I guess because the new face is female. I assume the person who did this would paint the easiest thing. And that's what we see in the mirror every day. So they gave themselves away because they didn't know Jane's work, her, her code. The party had broken up and most people went back to their homes. But a small group that included Peter, Clara, Ben, Myrna and Gabri took Fair Day back to the B&B. And they now sat in the large living room, sipping liqueurs and espresso. A fire had been laid and lit. Who knew about Fair Day before <laughs> Miss Neal was killed? The jury. Didn't you talk about it at your Thanksgiving dinner that Friday night? We talked about it a lot. Jane even described it. Uh, who else might have seen it? I'm sorry. I just realized I left my purse at Jane's. I'm going to nip over and get it. What, in the storm? I think I'm going to go home as well. It's been, a, it's been a long day. Unless there's something else I can do. Clara needed time to think. Was it possible? Surely she'd gotten something wrong. But the damning idea had come back with force in the B&B &B just now. As they'd stared at Fair Day, all the pieces had come together. All the clues, all the hints. Everything made sense. She couldn't go home now. She was afraid to go home. Back at the B&B, &B, Beauvoir was finally alone with Gamache. So what do you think? Okay. Let's look at it one more time. What about Ben Hadley? Why him? He had access to the bows, has the skill and local knowledge. Miss Neal would have trusted him. And he knows how to paint. Apparently he's very good. And he's on the board of the Art Williamsburg, so he had a key to the gallery. Motive? That's the problem. There is no clear motive. Why would he need to kill Jane Neal? Come on. Peter Morrow did it. Who else? He and Clara inherited all the money. Clara stared at her reflection in the window. The ghostly, frightened woman looked back. Her theory made sense. Ignore it, the voice inside said. Let the police do their work. It was a seductive voice. To act on what she knew would destroy her beautiful life in Three Pines. But Clara knew the voice was wrong. She was almost there. I was getting worried. I expected you earlier. I've been thinking. Yeah, I know. I could see it in your face. When did you figure it out? At the party. But I couldn't get it all. I needed time to think, to work it out. Was that why you said she when you described the forger? Yes. I wanted to buy some time, maybe even throw the police off. It threw me off. I was hoping you meant it. But then at the B&B, &B, I could see your mind working. I know you too well. What are we going to do? I needed to see if you'd really done it. I felt I owed you this, at least. Clara, I love you, and I need you. You don't have to tell the police. There's no evidence. Even the test tomorrow won't show anything. I was careful. Why? Why did you kill Jane? And why did you kill your mother? Wouldn't you? Ben, don't come any closer. Ah, no! Ah, ah, Clara, stop struggling. You're just making things worse you for yourself. You let me go! I'm sorry. Clara, did you forget your... What? Chief Inspector, what does this, what does this mean? Where's, where's Clara? That's what we wanted to ask you. We need to speak with her now. Oh, I thought she went to Jane's, but that was, 
That was an hour ago. That's a long time to search for a purse. She didn't have a purse. She just wanted to go into Jane's home and think. But she's not back yet. Weren't you worried? Oh, I'm always worried about Clara. Hurry, Jean-Guy. We don't have any time to waste. But where to now? To Ben's house. Ben's the one that's been missing all along. Clara awoke with a throbbing head. Everything was black, <coughs> blinding black. Her face was on the floor, and she was breathing in dirt. She felt cold and sick. She couldn't stop shivering. She realized her arms were tied behind her back. She had a memory of being carried, drifting in and out of consciousness. Where was she? Oh, good, Clara. In spite of the sound effects, I see you're awake. Peter? Bad news, Clara. Peter isn't here. Guess where we are. What? You simply fell down the stairs into my basement. The electricity had been turned off. You stumbled and you fell. I'm just fixing the stairs now. Rickety old things. Gamash may suspect, but no one else will. Peter would never suspect me. I'll be the one comforting him in his loss. And everyone else knows I'm a kind man, and I really am. This doesn't count. Sergey, Sergey, open up! Ah, what is this now? Clara, what did you do? Clara, Clara, what are you doing over there? Clara, I don't have time for this. No! Where is she? Over here. The basement. A week later, they were gathered in Jane's living room, which was beginning to feel like home to all of them. <laughs> Outside, snow was falling, huge wet flakes that melted almost as soon as they landed and felt like horse kisses when they touched a cheek. I think it's beginning to stick to the ground. Disgusting. How'd you know it was Ben? At the party here, it came to me. But what did you see that we didn't? It's what I didn't see. I didn't see Ben. I knew Fair Day was a tribute to Timmer. All the people who were important to Timmer were in it. Except Ben. What a fool to have missed it. Took me a long time, too. I only saw it after staring at Fair Day in my room. No Ben. No Ben. I knew there was no way Jane would have left him out, but he wasn't there. Unless he had been there, and it was his face that he'd removed. But, but why did Ben panic when he saw Faraday? I mean, what was so horrible about seeing his face in a painting? Think about it. Ben injected his mother with a fatal dose of morphine on the final day of the fair, actually while the parade was on. He'd made sure he had an alibi. He was off in Ottawa at an antique show. And was he? Oh yes, he even bought a few things. Then he raced back here, it's only about three hours by car, and waited for the parade to start. Knowing I'd leave his mother? How could he have known? He knew his mother, <coughs> knew she'd insist. And she did. I should have stayed. But you weren't to know Ruth. He looked at the painting and he saw himself, apparently at the parade, there in the stands. He believed then that Jane knew what he'd done that he'd been in Three Pines after all. The strange woman was sitting next to Peter, a natural place for Jane to put Ben. He took Fair Day from Arts Williamsburg that Saturday after your Thanksgiving dinner, stripped away his own face and painted in another, but he made a mistake of making up a face. He also used his own paints, which were different from Jane's. Then he returned the work to Arts Williamsburg, but he had to kill Jane before she could see the chain. You put it beyond doubt for me. You kept asking who else had seen Jane's work. I remembered then that Ben had specifically asked Jane at the Thanksgiving dinner if she'd mind him going to the Art Williamsburg to see it. Do you think he was suspicious that night? Well, the look on his face when Jane said the picture was of the parade and it held a special message, she looked directly at him. Like a paranoid person, he read hidden messages into everything. Why did he kill his own mother? The oldest story in the book. What, that Ben was a male prostitute? Oh, that's the, that, 
That's the oldest profession. Where do you keep your head? Oh, never mind. I don't answer that. Greed. She was going to change her will. Not cut him out entirely, but give him just enough to live on so that he'd have to start doing something for himself. She knew then what kind of man he'd become. Does Ben realize what he's done? He's convinced he was totally justified in what he did. The Hadley money was his. The Hadley property was his. The idea of not getting his inheritance was so unimaginable, he felt he had no choice but to kill her. And because she put him in that position, well, it wasn't his fault. She brought it on herself. And he killed Jane because he thought she was announcing it to the world with fair day. You were a moth brushing against my cheek in the dark. I killed you, not knowing you were only a moth with no sting. Cast, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Louise Penny was right. There were some suspicious characters for sure. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful evening. We want to um, wrap it up with uh, just a few thank yous and then an announcement from Sister Connie of uh, the winners uh, from the uh, silent auction. So first of all, we want to uh, say thank you to uh, uh, the Dean and the Cathedral Church of St. James for a wonderful venue uh, for this evening. To thank our major sponsors and those who made special gifts to cover costs uh, related to the production of the radio play and those who provided for sound and lighting. Thank you to the Cathedral catering and security staff to the sisters who are here present, to Judith Milne, Jeanette Strong, and Shannon Epp for all their work behind the scenes. <coughs> and we certainly want to thank again the Nathan Hiltz Quartet, Chris, Alex, Tim, and Nathan, and Michael Burgess, director and narrator. all you villagers <laughs> and the two detectives three that's right three I also want to say that um, I think we uh, uh, for this evening owe a great debt of gratitude to sister Constance Joanna this was her inspiration and she has worked tirelessly to make this the wonderful kind of evening that it's been. And she continues to work very, very hard to make the Home for the Heart campaign the success we know it will be. Thank you, sister. Thank you so much. And you have no idea what he's done. Fred Hiltz has been my right hand through the capital campaign, where I've been his, I'm not sure which, uh, and he's, he's just been such a support. But we also have a number of people here who are on the capital campaign committee, one sitting on either side down here, the detectives. Um, <laughs> we're gonna make Olivia one as well, eventually. <laughs> so I, uh, also on behalf of all the sisters, I say a, a very warm and hearty thank you. Connie, so, bef before, uh, I, I, 
one of the people that we haven't thanked for the play is Nathan Hiltz, because as, as well as doing the whole of the first half, he did all the, the, all the music and all the sound effects uh, yeah, they for were this. Great. So, Nathan, thank you very much indeed. So, the uh, bread making lesson with Sister Elizabeth Ann, Stephanie Walter. You want to stand up and let us see who you are? We're all coming. No. Where is she? Oh, Stephanie, hi. <laughs> you can come, you can go over uh, to the auction table and pay your money. <laughs> <laughs> And they will give you the information to connect with Sister Elizabeth Ann, who's actually standing over there. <laughs> so thank you, Stephanie, so much. Thank you, all of you who pushed the bid up. It was wonderful. Um, the individual spiritual spa weekend, we have three people. Um, can you hear me? We have three people for this, the individual spa weekend. Uh, Dorothy Pierce, Richard Coutino, and Karen Turner. Would you like to stand up, wherever you are? Richard? I don't see any of you. Where are you? OK, they're hiding. And then the, uh, the um, couple spiritual spa weekend, we have um, Heather Gwyn Timothy and uh, uh, Ellen Johnson. <laughs> Interesting. And <laughs> Yvonne Berlinden. So congratulations to all of you. <laughs> this is a delayed gratification kind of uh, <laughs> prize, right? Um, and for the uh, coaching seminar, Reading Aloud in Church, um, Peter Bennett. Peter. eventually with Michael, but you could start by paying your money over there. <laughs> um, and then we have the Zentangle Finger Labyrinth. So the people who have uh, won the four of those are Maggie Barron, Quentin Toderick, or, is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, A.J. Finley and Tanya Dawson. Good. Congratulations. You get to actually take a prize home with you tonight. And thank you so much. And the private guitar lessons with Nathan Hiltz, it's Yvonne Verlinden. Thank you all very, very much and have a safe time home. I'm just going to ask uh, the Reverend Mother, uh, Sister Elizabeth, if she would uh, um, close with uh, the prayer that she has written for the Home for the Heart campaign. Please stand, if you're able. Loving God, who makes all things new, we give thanks for Mother Hannah's courage in starting a religious community in Canada in 1884, and for her vision of welcoming guests into our home with all the courtesy of love to enjoy a space apart for rest, prayer, and refreshment. In abiding commitment to this ministry of hospitality, we pray for your blessing on the renewal of our guest house. We give thanks for all who are supporting us in this work, and especially all of you who are here today. May our guest house continue to be an oasis, a home for the heart for many, both now and in years to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah.